as a nurse, it's important for you to understand healthcare economics. It is important, and there are a few obvious reasons that it's important. Healthcare is a significant portion of our gross domestic product. We spend over $9,000 each per year on health care. There is a lot of uncertainty in health care. You don't know when you're going to be sick, and you really don't know how much it is going to cost. And the third reason is that it's highly controlled by the government because of the substantial economic implications. In the United States, we are well aware that we've had Medicare and Medicaid for many years. We hear on a regular basis about the cost. And now we have the Affordable Care Act meant to help contain the cost and provide health care to a wider array of people. But the reality is, every year our health care costs escalate. So let's start by defining what we mean by economics, and specifically by healthcare economics. Economics is the social science that examines the strategies that people use when attempting to satisfy unlimited wants with scarce resources. A lot of people would say, is healthcare really a scarce resource? In reality, we know that it is. There's not enough for everybody to have absolutely everything that they want. Welfare economics is a numerical representation of the ordering over social states on the basis of which a person actually chooses. And finally, healthcare economics is an applied field of study that allows for the systematic and rigorous examination of the problems faced in promoting health for all. By applying economic theories of consumer, producer, and social choice, health economics aims to understand the behavior of individuals, healthcare providers, public and private organization, and governments in decision making. And as a nurse, you need to understand healthcare economics because it will help you better make decisions and influence policy in healthcare, and hopefully as a result, increase access and have greater outcomes or better outcomes for your patients. Kenneth Arrow is credited with being the founder of health economics. Now, he may deny that, and he may actually say that, well, it was a fluke because of something that he was asked to do. However, it wasn't until 1993 that Kenneth Arrow established health economics as its own field. Why would he do that? Well, for many of the reasons, health economics is important. There is a lot of uncertainty. A person never knows when they're going to break a leg or have a heart attack. And the result of that can be financially significant to anyone. Because we are risk-averse with our health, uh, we then go out and we want to purchase insurance that helps make sure that we mitigate any expenses we may have, especially catastrophic expenses. Also, historically, we have had a self-interest that tells us to not be fully honest with our insurance companies and sometimes even with our providers. Why would we not be fully honest? Well, until the Affordable Care Act, people could deny you insurance because of pre-existing conditions. That in itself would lead people to be dishonest about their health status. Your health decisions also affect you and they affect other people. And other people's health decisions not only affect them, but they affect you. Take, for example, flu shots. If I choose not to get my flu shot and get the flu, I might give it to you. And likewise, if you don't get your flu shot and get the flu, you could give it to me. 
as a nurse, we all know the importance of herd immunity. So Kenneth Arrow basically had this theorem that evolved from Paradian welfare theory and the voting paradox. One form of voting theory is the majority rule, but that fails to incorporate the intensity of a person's preferences. And for example, under majority rule, a congresswoman may agree to vote for universal health care, which she doesn't feel strongly against, in the hope the favor will be returned later when she wants another congresswoman to vote for something she really cares deeply about. Thus, it fails to meet the criteria of efficiency or Pareto optimality because the majority will win even if it harms the welfare of the minority. Now, for nurses and nurse practitioners, I tried to put this into a format that might make it more understandable and more interesting to us. And so I thought about what are the criteria by which, if you used arrows of possibility theorem, this would be applied to providers. And so the, the theorem basically says that we all have preferences. And our preferences would then be, for a nurse practitioner, a specialist MD or a family practice MD. So we would ask, do I prefer a nurse practitioner or a family practice MD or a specialist? Under the con condition of unrestricted domain or universality, this must work for every possible configuration of social ordering. The Pareto principle, if everyone prefers a nurse practitioner to a family practice MD, the society must prefer the nurse practitioner to the family practice MD. The next option is non-dictatorship. Preference is based on choice. And no one person, no one man. So if he prefers a nurse practitioner over a family practice MD, then the nurse practitioner is, even if it is not beneficial to the rest. Citizenship sovereignty or non-imposition basically says that if I'm choosing a nurse practitioner is taboo, even if a nurse practitioner is preferred over the family practice MD, then the social welfare function is imposed. So in other words, I can't choose something that society basically doesn't allow me to choose. It's kind of like choosing a fully independent nurse practitioner in the state of Missouri. And then independence of irrelevant alternatives, which is that orderings must relate to the choices available and not to any other choices. So you notice I didn't have a physician's assistant as a choice on here, and therefore a PA is not a choice. You can go through it and think about it, but it's one way to think about the impossibility theorem that might make it easier for nurses to understand. So what's the vision? The vision is to decrease the level of unnecessary disagreement about health policy by determining positive facts. And we do that frequently through research. So another thing that you then need to understand is welfare economics. And it's really always funny to me that when you say welfare economics, people think about welfare. But that's not really what we mean. What we mean is people know what is best for them. Markets will act in a way that is ultimately most beneficial for society. And we can think of healthcare as a market. People will trade until there is no advantage to the trading and equilibrium is reached. An assumption of consumer theory is that people take into consideration their preferences and make the choices that will be most beneficial to them. In other words, we all have a lot of self-interest, and that even applies in healthcare. 
So the answer to the other to the earlier question about why is healthcare economics important or is it and is it different than any other form of economic theory? And to me, the answer is clearly yes. Health economics is different. And it's different because there is uncertainty in health. People often don't know what they are buying or the resulting outcomes. When you go to a provider, they basically can choose to give you information or they may leave out information. But even if they tell you the full information and you go in and have a treatment, you're not guaranteed of an outcome. You're not guaranteed that it's absolutely going to solve your problem. Insurance makes it different because we buy it to reduce our risk, and thus we don't pay the full cost of the care. And that does have an impact on the decisions that we make. The third reason is there is information control. Patients are dependent on providers for information, which may lead to a conflict of interest. And there really is a great disparity in power in a physician or provider-patient relationship. The provider controls the information, which influences the patient to make a decision, and the patient then pays that same provider to provide that care based on the information that they provided. You can obviously see the ethical concerns that could occur in this situation where the information that the provider gives you directly impacts his or her income. There are many restrictions on competition in healthcare, licensure being the big one. Um, ethical standards, and then limitations on who can do what. So it isn't just that you have to be licensed in a state, and that isn't always transferable across state lines, but we also limit by licensure who is allowed to do what procedure, even though there are other people that may clearly be qualified to do it and could do it cheaper, but we don't allow it based on the law. And as any provider knows, there's a whole lot of lobbying and a whole lot of money spent to maintain that status quo. And finally, there are government subsidies and public programs. And the biggest of these that we know of are Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the, the VA health care system, military medicine, Indian Health Service, uh, just to name a few. So it's all about choice. And the question is, how much money do you spend for risk or less risk? So which insurance uh, policy do you buy? Um, do you spend the money and join that gym and go to reduce the risk of heart disease or diabetes? It's about the money and it's about the risk.